Okay. Now it's going to take a, a couple of minutes to complete, so we'll come back and have a look at it later. This week, two important announcements were made in the development of optical computers, computers which use light beams and lenses rather than electricity and silicon chips. They should eventually be able to process information up to 10,000 times faster than today's computers. One announcement comes from the Bell Laboratories in America, where researchers demonstrated the first experimental optical computer processor. They claim their device proves that the technology works. The performance of conventional computers based on silicon chips is limited by the number of wire connections you can make to each chip. The most yet achieved is just over 400. But using light, it's theoretically possible to connect millions of channels of information to an optical chip. And in a major step towards this goal, scientists from the Heriot Watt University in Edinburgh say they've produced a grid of 225 beams of laser light, each of which can be aligned with enough precision to be used as a connecting channel in the optical computers of the future. The first strong scientific evidence to support the controversial treatment of Parkinson's disease by implanting fetal tissue was published in Science magazine this week. The disease which inflicts crippling muscle rigidity and tremor is caused when the brain cells that produce the neurotransmitter dopamine degenerate. In the new technique, implanted brain cells from aborted fetal tissue are intended to replace the patient's dead cells and produce dopamine. The latest trial, based at Lund University in Sweden, has been independently monitored by British scientists who have used brain scans taken before and after the transplant to assess dopamine production. The results clearly show that the fetal cells have continued to grow, matching the steady improvement of the patient's symptoms. Well, whilst this technique will remain highly controversial for its reliance on fetal material, if the approach continues to prove successful, it may have potential for a whole range of other nervous diseases, such as Alzheimer's and motor neuron disease. At the meeting this week of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the scientific working group claimed that hard evidence of global warming won't be available for several years and nor will detailed predictions from computer models. The question is, should we now be taking action to reduce global warming anyway? Dr. Jeff Jenkins, who presented the science group's report, told us, as we put more resources into research, this will deepen our understanding of the problem but he went on to emphasize that many of the uncertainties would not be resolved quickly. He refused to comment on the implications of this for policy makers, but other scientists at the meeting were more open about wanting action. One of them, Jackie Karras from the Climate Research Unit at East Anglia, told us that the evidence still pointed towards marked climate change, even if we did lack some kinds of hard data. Scientific uncertainty wasn't a reason to put off action now. Well, one person who isn't waiting for more information on the greenhouse effect is Dutch geochemist Professor Olaf Schulling, who's devised a scheme to raise the height of the Dutch coastline against rising sea levels by pumping sulfuric acid into the ground. The acid reacts with chalk to form gypsum, which expands to twice the volume of the original chalk, and that could raise the land by almost a metre. Professor Schulling admits two major disadvantages carbon dioxide is produced in large quantities and the acid pumped in could contaminate water supplies so more research is needed but places like the Maldives, even East Anglia could yet be fighting back the tide just down river from London Derry is the new foil bridge completed five years ago its central span is one of the longest in the world to be built without overhead suspensions. It also happens to be the windiest site for a bridge of this size in the UK. All of which makes it the perfect test case for the Science and Engineering Research Council's programme to find better ways of monitoring the life of bridges and other large-scale structures. The tricky thing about this one is the airflow over the bridge. It's built as two separate sections which move independently in response to wind or traffic. The worry's always been that as these sections rise and fall, 
complicated wind eddies could build up, causing violent oscillations. It's a bit like jumping up and down on a trampoline. Momentum can build up very rapidly from only a little force. The most dramatic example of this effect was the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Here, at quite modest wind speeds, it could oscillate like this. Or this. And then finally, this. Now, engineers build in big safety margins to avoid such catastrophic results. But as any bridge ages, it has to be routinely checked to make sure it's behaving as predicted when designed. So on the foil bridge, engineers from Queen's University Belfast have devised an automatic system for monitoring the deflections between the two sections. Well, I'm now inside one of those box sections. And that sound that you hear is the traffic passing just over my head. Now, down here is one of the targets for a set of lasers that are set up at the centre of the bridge. There are four lasers altogether, two in each of the box sections. Each one points in opposite directions, and they send out their beams from this, the centre point of the main span, all the way down to the targets fixed at the bulkheads at either end. As the centre of the bridge moves, the spot of light moves with it. Any deflection is picked up by a tiny camera which automatically sends its signal to a computer. The computers from each are linked up to one system so that the measurements from both spans can be monitored simultaneously together with any meteorological data gathered on the bridge. And all that information is then relayed back to a rather more convenient base in Belfast. Now this is one of the many recordings made this morning and it's taken over a period of a few minutes and what it shows are the deflections in the central span of the bridge. These small oscillations of about 10 millimetres are those caused by the wind, but this big drop of some 150 millimetres, that's some six inches, was caused by a passing lorry. But what the engineers are interested in is the frequency of those vibrations so that they can tell exactly what's happening to the structure itself. The computer can analyse the complex vibrations in each deflection and show the relative strengths of all the different frequencies present. And it's clear that most of the vibrations caused by the lorry occurred at a very low frequency. But this second peak here is what's called the natural frequency of the bridge. That is the vibration that's present all the time within the structure. What the engineers have to watch out for is any shift in this natural frequency, because that would show that there was a fault in the structure, perhaps a crack. Now, what happened at the Tacoma Narrows Bridge was that the wind created a vibration which exactly coincided with the natural frequency of that particular bridge. So they reinforced each other and made ever larger oscillations. If they'd had this equipment then, they'd have seen this peak go right off the screen. Well, so far I'm glad to say nothing like that has shown up here. In fact, the bridge is reacting exactly as predicted at the design stage. But over the next few years, as well as just monitoring this bridge, the system will give engineers a far greater knowledge of how structures like this behave, knowledge which can be incorporated in future designs. Well, that's just about all from us this week. But before we go, let's just take a last look at Howard's cake. It's just finished. I'm very pleased with it. Come and have a look at this, Kate, over here on the table. <laughs> What do you think of that one? Oh, wow, it's brilliant. You, you didn't know we were doing that, did you? <laughs> no, that is a real surprise. <laughs> oh, lovely. And well, of course, it all goes to show that you can have your cake and eat it. Oh, no. That time we went home. We'll be back at the same time next week, Thursday at 8. Join us then, please. Until then, good night. Well done. Congratulations. <laughs> Welcome to the show. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <not> <laughs> so better looking than I am, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get my joke in the back. <laughs>